This is Dr. Ben White with the Rational Wellness Podcast, bringing you the cutting edge information on health and nutrition from the latest scientific research and by interviewing the top experts in the field. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes and YouTube and sign up for my free ebook on my website by going to drwhites.com. Let's get started on your road to better health. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a ratings and a review. That way more people will find out about the Rational Wellness Podcast. Also, you can go to YouTube and watch a video version. And if you go to my website, drwhites.com, you can find detailed show notes and a complete transcript. So today we're going to talk about the gut-brain axis with Dr. Robert Silverman. The gut-brain axis refers to the bi-directional, both ways, communication that occurs between the gastrointestinal tract and the brain and the central nervous system. The gut microbiota communicate with the brain through the vagus nerve, through the production of neuropeptides, um, through the production of neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA, through the immune system, and through altered intestinal permeability. The brain plays an important role in the modulation of gut functions, such as motility, secretion of hydrochloric acid, bicarbonates and mucus, and the gut immune response. The brain communicates um, with the gut through the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system. The brain also communicates with the gut through the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis using hormones, which are essentially chemical messengers to control the digestive process. The vagus nerve is one of the main pathways for nervous system communication between the brain and the gut. Dr. Robert Silverman is a chiropractic doctor clinical nutritionist, international speaker, and author of Inside Out Health, a a revolutionary approach to your body, an Amazon number one bestseller in 2016. Dr. Silverman has a forthcoming book, Super Highway to Health, which is a complete guide to understanding the gut-brain axis and how it impacts overall health. Dr. Robert Silverman has a full-time private practice in White Plains, New York, where he specializes in the treatment of joint pain with innovative science-based non-surgical approaches and functional medicine. And most important, Dr. Robert Silverman is the chosen one. Rob, thank you so much for joining me today. (laughs) It's great to be here, Ben. That was a great intro. Thank you so much. I'm excited about it. Okay, great. So uh, why have you made the Gut Brain Access uh, your focus with your new book, Super Highway to Health? which is going to be released in February of next year. You know, for me, uh, I practiced 20 years, and I found this may be the key axis to our health. And I think it was uh, overlooked uh, up to most recent memory. And I believe that if we have a strong gut-to-brain connection, that when you you will see a lot of health conditions quench. So without question, the gut-to-brain axis is the topic of 2019 and beyond. Uh, In the functional medicine world, it's commonly accepted that the gut is often the root cause of many other health problems, but this is not commonly accepted in the general medical community. Can you explain the impact the gut has on our health, and can you also explain why the traditional medical community um, doesn't seem to appreciate this connection? You know, um, let's go through all the good stuff, and then maybe we can... uh, uh, get get to why uh, they're not embracing it. The medical field. It's interesting. Although there are some a lot of medical DOs, MDs, DOs that are really coming in and looking at the functional medicine, functional nutrition model. So the gut, without question, as everybody knows, is 80% of our immune cells. So I'll say that again. It's 80% of our immune cells. What have you done for your guts lately? Do you have the guts to be healthy? Your gut is where your macro and micronutrients are absorbed. That's foods, vitamins, and minerals the bulk of the absorption occurs in a misnomer called the small intestine. The small intestine is 90% of the size of our intestinal tract, yet we call it the small intestine. Food, 
nutrients and water are supposed to be absorbed in the small intestines. The, a new study just came out that lymph nodes are pointed exactly at that property in the small intestine, whereas the large intestine, where a lot of bad things can occur, is a much thicker mucosal lining. It's actually three layers, the mucosal lining in the large intestine. The small intestine is a single layer epithelial cell that if you unraveled it, would be the length of a tennis court with the thickness of a paper towel. And what's most interesting to me is why people don't look at it. I cut my finger, I put a Band-Aid on it because I know to protect the barrier. We don't see the barrier in our gut, so we don't think to protect the barrier. So if our gut is damaged or it becomes leaky, if you will, too permeable, this can send a cascade of injuries, a cascade of inflammatory markers, and that cascade stimulates and starts outside our gut in our bloodstream. It can be localized inflammation, systemic inflammation, and ultimately leading to, and we'll go into more detail, I'm sure, autoimmunity. So the gut keeps what's inside your body from actually going outside your body. So everybody right now, the doctors all know this, but every uh, lay person, if you will, think about if your gut is too permeable or leaky, what's inside your gut is floating around in your bloodstream. Most people, when I say that, take a step back and go, oh, what do I need to do to keep this healthier? Now, why are the medical fields not taking this? It's interesting. I mean, I went to chiropractic school in 1996, and leaky gut was already coined. So I think that a lot of the medical fields haven't addressed this because a lot of the medications and a lot of their treatments are very adverse to gut health. For instance, antibiotics opiates. I mean, opiates, the word opiate means opium. It has a slight amount of opium in it, non-steroid anti-inflammatories like um, Advil, ibuprofen, um, Aleve, all damages the gut. They actually damage something called the tight junctions. Now, you and I always use the word tight junctions and they open up and they, we call that leaky gut. You know what somebody just said? It was actually a patient who said to me, so those tight junctions open up, I'm going to call them loose junctions. And I'm like, that's pretty good. You, I see you nodding your head. So I just don't think they've, you know, taken this concept. And it's indisputable about the gut being 80% of the immune cells. And, um, you know, for me, I'm pausing because it's so disconcerting because it's this constant battle every day. There are actually patients coming in and that already say, hey, what can I do for my gut? Right. The, the, one of the interesting things is all the myriad of non-gut related symptoms that can actually have their origin back in the gut. You can have skin problems, you can have neurological brain problems, you can have a host of other problems that if you clean up and fix the gut uh, will often ameliorate. Absolutely. You know, I have what they call my Dr. Rob's gut matrix and it's one slide and I can, I've done a whole weekend on a one slide. So if your gut is leaky, if your gut is damaged, or we can take it to the next step. If LPS, lipopolysaccharide, an endotoxin is expressed, lipopolysaccharide is on the inside of the mem on the inside of the body, holding the outside of the membrane, holding gram negative bacteria there and cytolethal distending toxins. If LPS is exposed, it leads to systemic inflammation. If your gut is too permeable, there's too many toxins or an excess amount of toxins going to the liver. 75% of the toxins that get fed to your liver get fed through your bloodstream from your gut. 25% gets fed through your portal vein. Leaky gut, damaged liver. Leaky gut, higher incidence of prediabetes, diabetes, obesity, because of the inflammation. In addition to that, we've also seen three times the incidence of heart attack now with the expression of LPS, leaky gut, leaky heart. Increased autoimmunity. Everybody comes in with a thyroid problem, so they think, or some autoimmune problem. Well, let's trace it back possibly to the gut. Leaky gut, higher incidence of musculoskeletal pain. 50% of people who have spondylarthropathies have a leaky gut. You and I started as chiropractors. We still do chiropractic. People are coming in with back pain. They think I'm nuts. I said, hey, I'm going to fix your area, your lower back, your L4, L5, but I got to fix your gut. And the literature is robust on that. In addition, and probably the biggest thing that we talk about is that gut to brain axis, leaky gut, leaky brain, leaky brain, leaky gut, gut on fire, brain on fire. Your gut communicates with your brain within a millisecond. Um, I, I also think it's interesting that you were emphasizing the small intestine and um, 
in addition to there not being enough focus on the gut, uh, what focus there is has been largely on the large intestine and doing stool samples and analyzing the uh, bacteria there, but um, not much has really been focused on the small intestine until all this focus on SIBO started coming in. But Dr. Pimentel right now is doing a major project to map out the microbiota of the small intestine, which really hasn't been done to this point. And I, I think that's going to be, you can see a lot more focus on understanding the small intestine in the future. Or I guess we should probably call it the long intestine instead of the small intestine. Long intestine with loose junctions. Yeah. I mean, the small intestine, we know we can have leaky gut. And you know, when you think about it, I ask a lot of people, I say, where has your gut leaky? And the question I really ask is, is it leaking a small, large, or both? Well, it's probably both, but it's probably more so in the small because the large intestine has all these really involved conditions like IBD, IBS, celiac, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Obviously, Crohn's is all the way through the track. Right. Um, the damage to the large intestine can also backlog to the small intestine. But interestingly enough, to get back to the gut-to-brain axis, if the large intestine is going back to the small intestine, it may be damaging the ileocecal valve, the flap or the doorway between the large and the small intestine, and what controls the ileocecal valve other than what you talked about earlier, the vagus nerve. Right. What are some of the ways that our brain uh, helps to direct the function of the gut? Well, let's talk about the vagus nerve. You, okay. you mentioned three. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let's do the vagus. Sounds good. There's three. You know, you really talked about you know, you know, the idea of neurotransmitters and everything. 93% of serotonin is your gut. Without question, um, those neurotransmitters are a player. Bloods, you know, we forget our blood system. We're all interconnected. So it's definitely going to communicate there. But the fastest way and the thing of most interest, because everybody's playing with it so much, is without question, once again, that vagus nerve, that cranial nerve, that bidirectional communicator. So the vagus nerve goes from the brainstem, the medulla oblongata, down through the transverse colon. It's on the outside of the transverse colon, but it innervates the larynx, the pharynx, the liver, the pancreas. It does everything in that area down. So it has an effect on heart rate. Now, the stimulation of the vagus nerve, just as an aside, is really implicated in the increase in heart rate variability. Increase your heart rate variability, it shows health. A lot of good blood markers go with heart rate variability. So the vagus nerve is 80 to 90% efferent. Now that means it's a sensory nerve that communicates. And the reason it's a sensory nerve, it's on the outside of the transverse colon and not on the inside. What does it sense? Dysbiosis or the unleveling of good and bad bacteria. And it does so and it stimulates something called toll-like receptor 4. Toll-like receptor 4, not to get too technical, is actually an innate immune stimulant on your intestinal, inside your intestinal tract. And what stimulates toll-like receptor 4? Lipopolysaccharide. So when it does that, the vagus nerve actually dims, and it dims, sympathetics go up, parasympathetics go down. The properties of the vagus nerve no longer function like it is a rest and digest nerve or your wine and diet nerve. It also relates, you talked about motility, the migrating motor complex or the migrating motility complex. We need a nine to 11 peristaltic contractions in our small intestine per day to move our full bolus from the small to the large intestine. When we have SIBO, we're down to three because we have a backlog of the bacteria and it's not moving through. Many attribute that SIBO to a decrease in vagal nerve stimulation. And then you have the ileocecal valve that may be open, so you get the backlog from the large to the small intestine, or it may be closed, and you can't get the small intestine to go to the large intestine. So one last parting shot on that before we go into more detail. When you have a concussion, it down-regulates your vagus nerve. You've got to treat the gut. 60% of concussion patients get SIBO. Interesting. Um, what are some of the ways that um, our modern lifestyle and the standard American diet affect the gut-brain axis? Well, I tell everybody, and this is in my upcoming book, I share it. I tell them this is my $1,000 nutritional consult. So everybody get ready. GPS. And you're going to laugh. No gluten, no processed food, no sugar. Take care of your DNA. No dairy, no nicotine, 
no artificial sweeteners. And if you want to add one more thing for your lucky seven, anything you're allergic to, don't eat. So we can cover the lectins in that seventh one, if you will. So, that, so we start with the, all the bad foods. Then right. we talk about the environment. You know, interestingly enough, the environment, BPA and phthalates, very basic stuff. So we get these environmental toxins that damage the integrity of our gut, our gut, which we want to keep in a pristine condition. And food, look at all the food chemicals, all the food gums, the emulsifiers. They all damage our gut lining. And, you know, we just talked about drugs, the different kind of drugs and everything. And let's not forget being a type A personality. How about stress? Absolutely increases um, stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. Yeah, that, that, and now you're getting from that gut to brain axis as you talked about in your intro to the HPA axis, which yeah. is that lateral periphery. So, you know, that gut to brain is the center, it's the highway, there's an exit to get on a, another road and that's HPA. So you brought up lectins, it's a little bit of a side path. but Here we go. Should, should we be scared to death about lectins? If I eat a lectin, am I going to die? If I eat a tomato, if I eat, uh, you know, some other, if I have a legume that has lectins, um, is that going to harm me? Um, so again, if we take wheat and dairy out, the amount of people that are showing to be allergic to lectins is much less. So do I think that everything's lectin and just take every lectin out? I would probably say no to that. So you're I would saying say, if I get tested for sensitivities to uh, lectins or to foods that have lectins and I don't show sensitivities and I'm good? Yeah. So basically my position will be if you take wheat and dairy out and you're not allergic to lectins, kumbaya. <laughs> That's going to be my answer. I, I, I think that Clearly, you know, uh, lectins are direct binders. If you're allergic to them, they will directly bind to a tissue and damage you. Um, however, if you're not allergic and you took wheat and dairy out, I think you can eat them. They've got a lot of food values. You know, at, at a certain point, if we're going to be so restrictive, there's nothing to eat. So we'll go back to a famous chiropractor called Jack Elaine, and He said, if man makes it, I won't eat it. Right. But, you know, tomatoes grow in the ground. Man doesn't make them. I, I, I mean, you know, you know, it's an interesting thing. And, you know, I'm a Tom Brady fan being an East Coast guy, even though I'm from New York. Okay. Uh, so that it was nightshades and everything like that. But the reason they didn't like nightshades was that they found out that insects died from chewing on the nightshades because there was a neurotoxin. I think we're a little bigger than the insects. So I'm not so sure that even nightshades are as deleterious as everybody thinks. Right. And, uh, you know, they've been part of a healthy diet for a long period of time. And, and I, I've had plenty of patients who eat nightshades regularly. And we, you know, we look for inflammatory factors. We look for, you know, try to screen them for potential for chronic health problems. And a lot of them don't show any problems at all from eating lectins. That's, that's what I've seen. Yeah. You know what? I'll take a tomato that isn't sprayed versus a tomato sprayed any day. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And that's a whole nother podcast, but basically I'm a big proponent of organic food or quality farm food and everything. And that's one of our biggest problems. Our food nutrient deficiencies are huge and they are without question damaging and ruining us to our gut to brain axis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pesticides and chemicals. So let, let's that be the next question is what about toxins and where, what role does that play in our uh, gut health and, and, the, and the gut brain axis? You know, the toxins may be one of the worst things. Now, when we talk toxins, we already did the gluten and the dairy, two of the more allergic foods. Right. We also covered the environmental toxins and the things, you know, a good, a great one to make sure everybody doesn't take is Roundup. I mean, they just paid a large amount of money because they're so damning to everybody's health. They've got glyphosate in it. The World Health Organization is called glyphosate, a cancer-causing property or cancer-causing ingredient. It damages the microvilli, which are these little finger projections in our small intestine to grab all our nutrients, and they damage them. So right then and there, obviously, we want to avoid the bad soils. Also, and something that I've asked a lot of people where they, in the farms is, is the farm or is, is there shade? So if there's shade, the water doesn't hit as hard. Or if is it an organic farm, but there's no regular soil there. Meaning if it's a full organic farm, 
it's fine. But if you have an organic section and a regular section, when it rains and it rains without trees, so you get off flooding, there's something called runoff. And you run off all the ingredients from one to the other. And even though it's organic soil, you may be getting the pesticides. So these are the type of questions that I like to ask, which farm, where is it going, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, to be honest with you, you know, the water, organic farming, in my opinion, is better, but it's certainly not perfect. And there's no way to make it perfect because they're not using purified water. So even if the water didn't run off from a regular farm to an organic farm, they're still using water that they're getting from the river or, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and chances are has some sort of toxins in it as well. Yeah, no doubt. And, and understand that organic is only 95% organic. So which speaks to the idea of we have, always have to do the best we can. There are certain supplements that we have to take and there are certain detox and gut helping programs that sh- we should embark on all the time. I just did a LinkedIn and we filmed uh, a video and the video said, here's one of the more commonly asked questions in my office. If I eat well, do I need supplements? Well, one, how many people eat well? So almost nobody. But right. yes, if you eat well, you still may need some supplements. And without question, you want to make sure the gut to brain axis stays in a very strong integrity and making sure it communicates all the time at optimization. This is really an excellent discussion, but I'd like to take just a minute to tell you about our sponsor for this episode. For this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast, we partnered with Hedry a collaborator in university studies on CBD with their own two unique formulas available to the public, Good Morning and Snooze. Designed for around-the-clock wellness, they feature CBD infused with specific terpene combinations to help you manage negative thoughts and experience clarity throughout the day and night. Visit Hedry, spelt H E A D E R Y dot com and use the coupon rational for 20% off. And now back to our discussion. Now, um, Dr. Jeffrey Bland originally developed the 4R program for healing the gut, but you have expanded it to the 7R program in your new book. Can you explain what your 7R program is and how Absolutely. it helps us heal our gut? Absolutely. And and everybody knows that Dr. Bland is the father of functional medicine. And I've had some personal time with him. And uh, we all wouldn't be here if it wasn't for his vision. I believe that he's a visionary. So kudos. I tip my hat to him. Um, And and the four hours was a while ago. And every time I see him and he sees somebody do a rendition, an expansion of it, there's a big smile on that man's face saying, wow, look, look, here's the seed and look where the plant's going. So I'm up to seven right now. So let's go through the seven. This is all pointed at the gut and the gut to brain axis. Number one R is to reset. Reset your lifestyle. If we did anything, resetting the lifestyle would be without question of the ultimate or utmost importance. Within that, resetting a lifestyle like a diet like we talked about. It could be a keto, it could be a plant-based, it could be a Mediterranean. We can expand on that if you want a little bit. We have to individualize it for that person. You Keto may work for you. Mediterranean may work for me. I've got a staff member here, and plant-based may work for her. With that being said, we should all exercise, get our steps up, some form of body resistance or weight resistance. We don't have to squat 900 pounds, but some body resistance, some form of flexibility. And now really let's chill with the blue light and all the technology, even though you and I are on our laptops right now. (laughs) Reset. Number two would be remove. And this is one of the biggest ones. Remove what? Remove toxins. Remove allergy foods. Now the real question is, and I don't know if we can cover it, is do food allergies give us leaky gut or did leaky gut cause the food allergies? So let's take out the high allergy food as our test at that point. So testing and not guessing is a critical element because that starts our baseline. Now remove, we're going to remove the bad bacteria very simply by using things like oregano oil, an emulsified oregano oil, which removes all the bad bacteria from the upper body and berberine HCL and other things that will remove bacteria from the lower body. Garlic's a great choice. SBI, serum bovine immunoglobin is a great choice because it actually mops the gut and takes the antigen, 
before it goes through the intestinal tract. And my ad there is, and this is a question that you and I have talked about multiple times. Do we do the gut or do we do detox? Well, I do the detox in the gut. That's when I do my 10, 15, or 30 day detox within part two of the removal phase. Then it's three, interesting three is to replace. What are we looking to replace? We're looking to replace stomach acids, pancreatic acids. It's really pointed at digestion. 60% of the gut is pointed at digestion. Now, a lot of people say the next one is re-inoculate. And I say, no, that's not the time to re-inoculate because the literature shows that if you have a faulty gut or a torn intestinal tract, the good bacteria gets through and your body still attacks any kind of bacteria because your immune system's on. At this point from section one, R1 through three, I recommend Saccharomyces boulardii. Saccharomyces boulardii is a yeast that functions like a probiotic that helps build the intestinal tract and also decreases your incidence of C. diff. So at this point, R4 is to regenerate, regenerate, repair, or what I like to call heal and seal the gut lining. So we use a plethora of nutrients. Some of these are called medical foods, nutrients that enable the gut lining to heal. They do so by promoting a microenvironment that's anti-inflammatory and specific nutrients that adhere to the mucosal lining and allow it to proliferate and grow. Some other ones aside would be alpha lipoic acid, fish oils. Fish oils are great for the biodiversity in the gut. Fish oils dim the signal of toll-like receptor four. So if you want good gut health, better use fish oils. Vitamin D also helps with the biodiversity. Number five, obviously then re-inoculate. And we can go into detail. We can spend all day here talking about the different kind of genus, species, and um, strains. Some of the things that I've, so it's, prebi it's probiotics and prebiotics. A couple of takeaways that I like is the probiotics, we want diversity, we always want to switch. Some of the hotter ones right now that I like are the endospore bacillus subtilis. It's an endospore. And the prebiotic that I'm leaning towards is not FOS anymore, it's XOS. XOS has a lot of literature, but the very basic takeaway is XOS feeds the good bacteria, FOS the bad bacteria and the good bacteria. So, so we, tell us what XO is, XOS is versus FOS. Xylo-oglio-saccharides. It's a different form of a carbohydrates where we call it fructo-oglio-saccharides. So if you guys can spell it, you may be able to beat those 12-year-old kids on the spelling bee that got everything right. Good luck. So XOS is really the choice right now. And something else that you may want to consider that in, in the remove phase is something, and you're gonna, we're gonna hear a lot about this, bacterial phages. The phages are the choice. So 110 years ago, or whenever they decided to make antibiotics, antibiotics were made and they decided on it because they were carpet bombers. They killed all bacteria. The bacterial phage kills one family of bacteria. Its structure is such that it attaches to the bacteria and it actually goes into the bacterial cell and getting in a bacterial cell, it populates and duplicates and explodes the cell. So what it does is, it's kind of like you have this city with bad guys, and it doesn't kill everybody, it kills all the bad guys, and then lets the microenvironment of the city, your gut, elevate. So bacteriophages are the thing they're all gonna talk about. There's a lot of excitement there, and they're used to kill superbugs. I've kind of been hearing about that for the last five or 10 years, and there's a few products, and then, mm -hmm. Some people say, well, look, you can't just have one product for killing all the different bacteria. And, and so far, not much has really come out of this literature. You know, the, the literature I've seen recently has been really strong, quite robust. So it's something I use. It, it's one of my go-tos. And like you said, there is no one product. Right. I've seen one product, but all it does is affect E. coli, right? No, there's a few more. I've got a whole bunch now. I'll, sh I'll be happy to share them with you when you're off the podcast. Okay. Love it. It's great. So I've been using them and getting really, really good results. The sixth R is to retain. It's actually retest and retain. You know, we have to do a baseline. Testing is a critical element. You know, we can talk a little about, about the testing that I recommend. And you all, and it's actually retest. What, what testing do you recommend? I like, you know what, if you're going to, without question, you don't have to put a gun to my head. So the tests that I really enjoy are the Cyrex tests. I found them to be quite effective in that they're great at testing for barrier issues and autoimmunity. And, and you know, the barrier is a problem you want to detect, correct. So explain uh, what you mean by testing the barrier. 
okay, well, there's specific proteins that you can test for. So for instance, let's take their array two. Their array two deals with gut permeability or heightened gut permeability. So they're testing for LPS, which we talked about as an endotoxin. They're also testing for occludin and xanolin, which are proteins that imply tight junction damage. And then they're talking about actomyosin, which is actually at the intestinal gut level. What they've also mixed it with in the real treat is they're also testing for something called immunoglobins, IgG, IgA, and IgM. IgG is our most common immunoglobin. It show, it's 75% of our immunoglobins uh, in our body or IgG, and it's the only one that can pass the placenta. IgG implies chronic inflammation. IgM implies acute inflammation. IgA implies reactivation. So you're seeing the damage and the area and the amount of autoimmunity going on. It's not just showing you damage. It's also showing you the damage that it can cause because autoimmunity is an issue. One aside to the autoimmunity is that as a chiro, people still come in for joint pain to me. We all know rheumatoid arthritis is autoimmunity. Osteoarthritis is also and you need to test the gut. So this um, Cyrex test is a blood test um, and it's designed to look for a leaky gut, right? Leaky gut, tight junction damage, that's a rate too. And um, also damage at the epithelial lining. People don't realize that you can have it. So here's your gut, so it's semi-permeable. So then you have LPS coming through causing a possible systemic inflammation. Interesting thing about LPS is it doesn't always have to cause symptomology, gas and bloating. There's something called now silent leaky gut that Tatis Karazian has coined brilliantly. And he's talked about, do you have fatigue? Do you have chronic inflammation in your body? Are you getting some forgetfulness? Well, you may not think it's attributed to the gut, but it really is. So these tests are great markers as a starting point just in the gut. They also have a SIBO versus IBS test because we know if we have IBS, a lot of people transpose into SIBO and that would be array 22. What about directly testing the gut by doing stool tests that look for pathogens, look for imbalances, look at, analyze the whole uh, microbiota? I think, yeah, those tests are great. I think that's another great test. Uh, I know exactly the Genova test that you're talking about, and some other people have other stool tests. The real question is, how much testing do we want to do? Do we want to test for food allergies? Do I'm a big proponent now of testing for genomic markers, trying to see where we are genetically. So for instance, can you, can you assimilate fat or do you assimilate carbohydrates? We all know that carbohydrates or improper carbohydrates are not a good choice, but we may assimilate them, so we may have to change our macronutrient content to the individuality of the patient in front of us. So testing, not guessing. That's actually chapter four in my book. Of course, you know, when you do a good stool test, it, it should include markers for whether or not you're breaking down your fats as well, because those will come out in the stool undigested. Absolutely. So testing is a critical element. Without, with, without question. Even just testing a body fat, seeing where somebody is. Visceral fat, that's indicative of things. You know, I've seen visceral fat decrease when we've corrected proverbial leaky gut. Yeah, for the stool testing, I prefer the PCR-based testing. Okay, I love it. Love it. Okay, um, so let's talk about the vagus nerve. All right. I, <laughs> what let's do we do? If there's communication problems, what can we do about it? Is there a way to fix yeah. the vagus nerve and, and, and make sure this communication functions properly? Well, before I started to really work with the vagus nerve, what I read, and it's still there, is to gargle, to cough, uh, things like that. And, and I've never found them to be speedy or extremely effective. There's now, now, what particular symptoms were you looking at that you expected these to have an effect on? You know, I kind of backed down with no pun intended. I was treating so many concussions and not getting the resolution that I needed till I really started to implement and understand the gut to brain, or if you will, the brain to gut axis. So when I did that, I realized the vagus nerve was the player. And then I started to work real hard, gather literature, and try things empirically in my office. So the thing I found the best to stimulate the vagus nerve, because the problem is it's dim, we want to stimulate, has been a 405 uh, violet laser made by Arconia. 
I have found that 30 seconds on each side to really stimulate the vagus nerve and upgrade that communication with the brain and gut axis. So that's number one. That you I do. do it along the neck where? Yeah, I go from the medulla oblongata at the brainstem down through the transverse colon, each side. Interestingly enough, vagus nerve left side is satiety, right side is mood and behavior. So there are some differences. Yeah, there you go. And it communicates really quick. Now, I, other than this part of the neck, afterwards, it's like deep inside the, the uh, body cavity, right? It is. So it's exposed going through the jugular foramen. There are three nerves that actually go there other than some vessels. But those nerves are spinal accessory and glossial pharyngeal nerve. But the vagus goes through there. So I catch it up here and I come down and I go through the whole area. Um, now I'm at the point where I'm using like a percussor where the ileocecal valve is to create tone or increase tone by the transverse colon. I'm taping the space. So, you know, I'm using a, a performance tape up here and a tape on the um, ileocecal valve. So we're getting the vagus nerve to go up. And how do we know that? Heart rate variability. I'm also coming out of my book with a vagus nerve nutritional protocol. So there's some nutrients that help stimulate the vagus nerve and feed it. And we've started, we've got about six to eight months of literature on that. And I'm very excited to share that with everybody. Interesting. What, what are a couple of the nutrients that stimulate the vagus nerve? Omega-3 fatty acids, believe it or not, are one of the big ones. No, no real surprise there. Um, green tea extract is another one. And um, you know what? I'll give you those two. And if you start with that, you're really, you're really going to get going. But I've got like six or eight nutrients that are really gonna get the vagus nerve to go. You guys are gonna love that. Don't worry, I'll post it online when the book comes out. So if you don't buy the book, you'll get, you'll get the post. I'll write a blog on it. Um, so I, you, you've been mentioning how you treat a lot of concussions. Um, can you talk about that? And um, how do you, uh, you know, what, what's your treatment protocol for concussions and what kinds of uh, sure. testing do you do? And then what types of uh, uh, nutraceuticals are beneficial after a concussion? All right, so concussion is basically injured more from shearing of the brain. Remember, the brain is made of the consistency of jello. That's right, jello. It's three pounds. It's a very small organ, yet it communicates with all the other organs in the body. So the shearing from the moving, that's where the tearing is. And it's, there are some tearing to brain matter, but the biggest tear is the axons, which allow you to communicate. And is so one of the key factors that the person loses consciousness during the trauma for a period of time, or is that not necessary? You know, the, the loss of consciousness isn't really a key determinant, and about 9.3%, a little less than 10% of people actually lose consciousness. So there are different grades, but they've kind of moved away from the grades. They're looking at the damage. So it's that sheer back and forth. Women are more susceptible to concussion than men. They have weaker neck muscles, more impact, more whip more sheer, they don't respond as well. We can go through that if you like, but some of the testing, very clear. Everything's in the eye, so we use a visual ocular motor screen. You can download that, this two and four page. The blood tests, I use the Cyrex blood brain barrier, so that is um, array 20. There's also some standard uh, blood tests now that you can look at. Some of the standard blood tests are um, interleukin-6, interleukin-8 and C-reactive protein, they'll show this tissue inflammation. In addition, it's something now called neurofilament light. It's a protein enzyme that the brain gives out. That's actually an early marker for Alzheimer's. It can depict Alzheimer's. Depending on what literature you read from 16 to 23 years, 80% of people who get a concussion who have the APOE4 allele in Alzheimer's increases your incidence, something to look for. Um, so those really cover the tests. The treatment are very interesting. It's a five-part treatment for me. Number one, upper cervical. Upper cervical in the occipital ridge, the occipital triangle. You really want to go for those muscles. The muscle that's most implicated is the rectus capus posterior minor because it has the strongest myodural ridge because it has parallel collagen fibers. So it gets whipped back and forth with the head. With that being said, any manual therapist, chiropractor want to go in there and work on that area. In addition, we've got to start looking at the neck. Most people didn't realize, they all looked at here and didn't realize the neck 
was holding the head up. I have torticollis, so my neck is crooked, but it makes my head look crooked. So it's intertwined. So we have to look at the neck. Jim McMahon does a phenomenal 30-30. Remember that quarterback from yeah. the Chicago Bears? You know, colored hair, crazy guy. And he just stands there now looking in a, with sunglasses in a dark room, having trouble articulating, doing puzzles. He went to a chiropractor in, in Long Island, New York, and he said that chiropractor was the first doctor who looked at his neck. So neck is a major thing, manually testing it, possibly adjusting it. Yes, medical doctors adjusting it. The literature is very strong on that. So that's the musculoskeletal chiropractic mode. The other modes are balance and visual gaze, balance training, proprioception. Eight weeks of proprioception have shown to increase the size of the cerebellum where the bulk of posture and nerve implement nerves are feeding. So that's a great thing. Proprioception, you're balancing space between your nervous system and your muscular system. Gaze stabilization is a big deal. Your ability for eye head movement. Dr. Ted Carrick, a chiropractor, has shown some great literature on that. I think it was in last year's Frontier of Neurology, if you want to see that study. Laser. I use a lot of transcranial lasers, 635 nanometers. The, break away, the takeaway there is 635 is shown to stop cell apoptosis, increase BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, which allow for brain neurogenesis. So the takeaway here is, and we've heard Dr. Promoter say this multiple times, the brain can now repair itself because we can have brain neurogenesis. Remember, neuroplasticity, the ability of our plastic brain, plastic, allowed to grow nerves. So I found the laser to be extremely effective for a great micro environment. And then I use a nutritional protocol. I'll give you the five nutrients. I have 15, let's give you the five. Magnesium l Magnesium l has really shown to decrease um, any kind of injury, decrease brain aging, and upregulate the ability of available magnesium both in the brain and the spinal cord. Omega-3 fatty acids great for healing the brain, cell membrane. They actually enable you to avoid concussions. So everybody who's treating teenagers or college kids or somebody who's in a contact type sport, make it three fatty acids. Um, turmeric is always a great choice. We all know that. Pro-resolving mediators, specialized pro-resolving mediators allow for the resolution of inflammation. And I'll make it real easy. L-glutathione decreases brain tissue damage by 70%. So a liposomal glutathione is my choice. There's your big five. Cool. So you're talking about concussion, but we've learned in the last number of years that a lot of football players and other athletes, and even apparently people who don't engage in athletics, undergo some brain damage um, that is not, uh, it's not really defined as a concussion. It's called uh, chronic traumatic encephalitis. And so it's this um, structural damage to the brain that can't be seen on a normal scan. Um, how do we s diagnose that? And can some of these protocols uh, be beneficial for those patients as well? Yeah, CTE, you know, they did a study of uh, dead NFL players. 111, 110 had CTE, this damage to the brain. So it's sort of uh, sub-concussions can equal multiple concussions. So really the best tests are, for me in here, are tandem gait. What an easy thing. Tandem gait, if you, you, you remember, you grew up at a similar time to I did, you know, if you couldn't walk a straight line, you had too many back, <laughs> back too much. So I like the tandem gait. You should also test the blood-brain barrier. And that's a hidden thing. You know, I go into great uh, detail in my book, the, the blood-brain barrier is made up of the same protein structures as your gut. It's a single layer organism of the same proteins. The only thing is I call it the balancer of the brain. It so so are, you, are you saying that using um, that um, gut brain barrier test from Cyrex Array 2 um, is a way to help uh, diagnose CTE? I, I won't say CTE, but I test Array 20 for the blood brain barrier. And I found out if you yeah. Okay. Yeah, array 20. So the only thing that isn't protect, the blood-brain barrier obviously is what it says. It filters blood, 400 miles of blood to the brain. The only thing that really isn't encased in the brain, in the blood-brain barrier is the pituitary because it has to have direct contact with the blood. But once the blood-brain barrier is open, it's direct access to neural autoimmunity in the brain. And that's a lot of CTE and other things that we're talking about. So I'm big on that 
blood brain barrier, some cognitive tests work really well. And the treatments that I mentioned before are treatments that you could use virtually mimicking the same treatments I just mentioned for CTE. Are there any other tasks that correlate with CTE? You know, that there are now some brain scans and MRIs that are being very revealing. So the brain scans are revealing the MRI. The key to the MRI is structure and function. If they have CTE, they have structural damage. But if it, somebody comes in your office, you're gonna, you want to ask for an MRI that's structure and function. Structure is the structure of the brain, and function is the blood flow. So obviously, one of the biggest things that occur after concussion is lack of blood flow for the first seven to 10 days. So you may want to get an MRI to see and reveal what's going on inside the main organ in your body. But a standard MRI won't show it. Standard MRI does not show it, so you've got to ask for that structure and function. And I can tell you so many times where I've had to ask, and I've been corrected, and I've had to re-ask for it. But, but what exactly is that called? It's, it's not called a structured function MRI, is it? No. Well, you know what? It's a funny thing. My MRI place, if, you, if I were to walk there, it's 10 feet away, and I tell them that I want a MRI that reveals the vessels, and they're able to do it. So that's how I word it. Just say, I, I want to see blood vessels. I want to see the functional movement of the blood and they're like okay we know what to do right fill out this form okay i can put in the comment section what they're calling it and everything it's sort of like uh it becomes rote to me at this point right good so i think this has been a good discussion um do you want to give listeners three things that they can start on tomorrow for better gut brain health absolutely so i'm going to make it real easy adhere to my gps i said it before no gluten no processed food, no sugar, take care of my DNA, no dairy, no nicotine, no artificial sweetener, and guess what? Get a good night's sleep. That's great. So how can our listeners get a hold of you and find out about your books and your programs? Well, that, great, thank you. Um, my website is drrobertsilverman.com, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Dr. Robert Silverman. I'm, I'm very active socially. I'm always posting. I post two to three times a day. It's a great way to get in touch with me. And anybody wants to email me, info at drrobertsilverman.com. Awesome. Thank you, Rob.